welcome to the National Wilderness Skills Institute. We're excited to have you with us for the traditional skills and minimum tool leadership panel discussion. And this is in the traditional skills track of the event. Every year, the US Forest Service recognizes an employee or crew that demonstrates outstanding initiative, creativity, and commitment to wilderness principles by accomplishing a difficult or challenging wilderness stewardship activity using traditional skills. During this panel discussion, you will hear from some of the award recipients from the last five years as they share information about their work and the future of promoting traditional skills for wilderness work. Hi, I'm Carol Hennessy. I'm the Wilderness Program Manager on the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest in the Northern region of the U.S. Forest Service. Togan Capozo is with us. She is the um, Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers Program Manager in the Pacific Southwest region of the U.S. Forest Service, and she is our Zoom host. With that, I'm gonna just introduce briefly the people you'll see on the presentation. Adam Washback, he is the Recreation Staff Officer in the Gardner Ranger District of the Custer Gallatin National Forest in the Northern region of the Forest Service. Cindy Ebert, she is the Realty Specialist on the Dillon Ranger District on the White River National Forest. Kelly Pearson is a retired wilderness technician on the Shawnee National Forest of the US Forest Service. And Tori Haka is the Eastern Region Authorities Coordinator and she is with us live today. Because um, Tori can't stay with us for the whole time, and because she has a very unique perspective on this traditional tool award, I'm going to let her introduce herself a little bit more, tell you briefly about her award, and maybe make some points um, that probably have a very unique perspective when it comes to traditional tool awards. So Tori, I'm going to hand it over to you right now. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Carol. And hello, everyone. My name is Tori Haka. And as Carol mentioned, I am coming to you from the eastern region of the U.S. Forest Service, where I sit in the western upper peninsula of Michigan. It's actually the story that I'm going to tell a little bit later during the presentation is the story about a specific wilderness area in the western upper peninsula of Michigan. And the perspective that I'm bringing as the authorities coordinator happens to be that my purview and perspective is likely very different than the rest of you sitting in the room listening to me talk. My role as an authorities coordinator is to help coordinate, align, educate, train, and assist national forests, partners, state and other counterparts and stakeholders in general work with the national forest system to implement certain objectives. I primarily specialize in good neighbor authorities, stewardship contracting and agreements, and other implementation authorities granted to us by Congress. But it's this ability that I have to see and connect and bring people together with the authorities that we have that makes it so unique. So from my perspective in the regional office at this time, it was an honor for me to be called upon from the Ottawa National Forest, as well as some of the Shoshone Pack Mule String members and the Nature Conservancy partnership that we had happen a couple of years ago, where we used a stewardship agreement, leveraging the value of timber to help pay for restoration work in the McCormick Wilderness Area. It was the sheer dedication, the involvement, the coordination across the country, within our region, and with partners that received the, the award for the traditional skills and minimum tools in 2019. You're gonna hear more about that in just a few moments. And you're going to hear a lot of perspectives that I bring about integrating, encompassing, opening up the, the skill set, the passion and empowerment to not only our Forest Service people, but the partners that can help us do our work. We've heard very clear charge from the chief of the Forest Service and other stakeholders that we can't do it alone and that we have to be able to have access to our volunteers. We have to have access to our publics and that we can help. Um, we can help transcend messages through generations by leveraging certain people like our partners and volunteers to help us share that, um, that message. So Carol, I don't have too much more of my perspective to share other than you're gonna hear the opportunities about how using creativity, perseverance and sheer dedication and will to get work done uh, really helps the wilderness preservation system. And I think moving forward, it helps communicate, promote, and idealize this, this idea of and concept of minimum tools leadership. So I hope that I can stick around as long as I can, and I will be present while I'm here, Carol, and I'll let you know when I depart. But thanks for the opportunity and the, you know, the sharing that I have. You can reach out at any time with the contact information that can be provided. 
Thank you for your engagement, Tori. That was wonderful. And so we're going to go ahead now and ask Togan to transition us to the presentation um, so we can watch Adam and Cindy and Tori and Kelly. Okay, well, hey, welcome. Um, welcome to the Traditional Skills and Minimum Tool Leadership panel discussion. My name is Jimmy Godry. I am the Wilderness and Wild Scenic River Specialist from the Northern Region. And a big shout out and thanks to the panelists for taking the time to join this discussion today. Um, it's something that the planning team, as we thought about traditional skills and doing a virtual workshop, this is one of the beauties of, of um, being here and being able to do this in this format. And so I wanna talk a little bit about why we're here. Every year the Forest Service recognizes an employee or a crew that demonstrates outstanding initiative or creativity um, or a commitment to wilderness principles by accomplishing a difficult or challenging wilderness stewardship activity using traditional skills. That's the connection here. And the panel members that we have here today have all been a part of a project or have been individually recognized for their participation in a project that was um, awarded and uh, nominated and awarded sometime within the last five years. So we reached out to them and said, hey, would you be willing to talk all things traditional skills and about your award for the National Wilderness Skills Institute? And so that's, that's what we're gonna do today. Um, kind of how we're gonna spend our time is that each panelist is gonna have some time to introduce themselves and talk about the work that they have done uh, and what received recognition. After that, we have a series of questions that we've teed up for them to respond to, and hopefully that'll create some dialogue amongst us. And then lastly, as a part of the session at the Skills Institute, we're gonna have a live question and answer session that a few of the panelists will, will be a part of. And I believe that we'll have enough expertise in the room to continue the dialogue uh, live and in person. And with the intent of uh, perhaps some conversation starters, this might be something uh, that we carry forward into a future session. Maybe it helps us identify work we need to take on as an agency. Who knows? I think that's the beauty of a session like this. And so if we're ready, uh, here, here's the plan. Uh, we're gonna start and I was gonna uh, first move to Adam and then we'll move on to Cindy and then Kelly and Tori. And again, you'll, you'll each get a chance to introduce yourself and uh, looking forward to hearing a little bit about the project for which you were nominated. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it to you, Adam. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Good morning or afternoon, depending on when you play the video. My name is Adam Washebeck. I'm a recreation staff officer on the Custer Gallatin National Forest in Gardner, Montana. Um, from 2008 until 2020, I was a wilderness ranger. Almost all of that was in the Selway Bitter at Wilderness. Um, and in that time, I got to use a lot of traditional skills and I got to teach a lot of traditional skills. So um, I'm a rigger, packer, blaster, crosscut saw sharpener. I'm, I'm that. Uh, I'm working as the crosscut saw coordinator for region one and I've been really lucky to travel to teach and to share a lot of the on the ground knowledge that we use in our wilderness areas. So that is why I was nominated and received an award um, longtime wilderness ranger and, and traditional skills educator. So happy to be here and happy to share what I know and what I think. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. You bet. Cindy, you're, you're up next here. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Cindy Ebert, and I work on the Dillon Ranger District in Silverthorne, Colorado, which is on the White River National Forest in the Rocky Mountains. Um, my entire Forest Service career has been spent on this district when I started as a seasonal wilderness ranger, working in the Eagle's Nest and Ptarmigan Peak wilderness areas, and eventually hired as a lead wilderness ranger, and eventually into the Trails Wilderness and OHV program manager position. Um, during these years, I worked with a variety of partner organizations and interns and forest service um, seasonal employees in order to accomplish our, our wilderness work. And just recently this past fall, I transitioned into the lands and minerals specialist position on the district. So 
I don't have managing wilderness under my purview anymore, but it remains very close to my heart and I continue to help with the transition of the program here on the district. So in 2020, while I was still in my wilderness manager position, I was definitely honored to receive the traditional skills and minimum tools award. And um, my nomination letter was sent in by a mentor of mine. And one of the things that she focused on in that nomination letter was for my promotion of traditional skills, specifically as it related to CrossFit saw trail clearing in our wilderness areas um, that have been really heavily impacted by the mountain pine beetle epidemic. So a disclaimer, I really did accept this award on behalf of the entire wilderness team and not just myself. Um, it was definitely a group effort with partners and other Forest Service staff. So a little history on that mountain pine beetle ep epidemic and kind of what we did um, here on the Dillon Ranger District. You know, around 2010, we saw the mountain pine beetle epidemic start to kind of devastate our lodgepole pine population, much of which is in our wilderness area. And over the last decade, the forest has started to unravel. And as a result, um, we're seeing thousands of trees fall across our wilderness trails every year. So traditionally our Forest Service Wilderness crew had been the main workforce that logged out our trails along with a few volunteers. Um, prior to the mountain pine beetle epidemic, that model worked, but as the situation worsened, we needed to come up with a new model. Um, our wilderness areas have portions of them that are very accessible and we have trailheads that are literally at the end of subdivisions near town. So our early season forest service trail clearing efforts were a little delayed by the time our wilderness crew came on, went through training and got out on the trails. And so during this early season time, we started to see an increase in illegal chainsaw use by the public who were eager to get out on the trails in their backyard and um, start hiking as soon as the snow melted. So we decided to kind of shift our model and kind of came up with like three components of it. And the first was maintaining, you know, our Forest Service crew out there logging out the trails. The second was we added anywhere from three to five weeks of Youth Corps crews certified to use crosscuts um, to get more into the backcountry portions of the wilderness to, to log out those trails. And then the third was to kind of certify volunteers with um, our local wilderness group called Eagle Summit Wilderness Alliance. And, and that group is really, you know, taken off with um, their certification. And um, we're hoping to have another 18 folks certified this summer. And so we'll have a total of around 31 volunteer Sawyers. And I think the reason why that program kind of took off for us is that we, really shifted us trying to manage it over to our partner organization and they've done a great job of that. So just a little highlight of, I think you know, one of the, the reasons why I was chosen is just kind of promoting that um, Sawyer volunteer Sawyer program. And I know that many of you throughout the country have very similar Sawyer programs with volunteer, volunteer organizations. So um, I guess I feel humbled that our program was highlighted for that, for that 2020 award. So um, thanks for letting me be a part of the panel and discussion today. Okay, now I think we're going to move to Kelly. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Pearson. Um, I recently retired as of the end of December 21 as the uh, Wilderness Technician and Youth Hosted and Volunteer Coordinator on the Shawnee National Forest. Um, it was a great job, I miss it, but I do like retirement, just putting that out there. Um, so in 2016, uh, the Shawnee National Forest was recognized um, for our response to a small, small plane crash that occurred in uh, Burden Falls Wilderness Area. It was a single engine plane, two souls on board, um, unfortunately, there were no survivors. So um, once the initial work of the NTSB was complete, um, the uh, remains were respectfully removed, um, emergency passed. Um, the district ranger sat down with a few of us and said, how can we approach removing uh, the wreckage from this wilderness area? Very popular wilderness area. Uh, that crash site was located really close to the second highest waterfall in Illinois. 
So a lot of visitation occurred there. So we had to consider, <clears throat> you know, integrity of the site, protecting the public, and then allowing us to get our work done. So um, we looked at all scenarios, you know, options from helicopter with a long line to pack stock, removing the wreckage. And <clears throat> we ended up um, falling on the idea of looking to our wilderness trail crew to help us remove the wreckage. It was fairly small debris field, so um, easy to manage it. So, yep, we used five gallon buckets um, to collect the micro debris, <clears throat> toted the larger pieces of debris to a staging area at the end of a canyon. And then the wilderness trail crew would come to the end of the bluff, the staging area, with uh, cash hauler backpacks, five gallon buckets, and then we would load them. Then they would hike out to the road and um, <clears throat> um, deposit their um, freight in a trailer. We also used uh, packing mantis and um, game sleds to um, freight out the larger pieces of debris. So, you know, my hat's off to that crew. They, they had been working hard since early May. They were in tremendous physical condition and uh, <clears throat> were very sensitive to what had happened there, very respectful of what had happened there. All of them put their backs into it and in short order. Um, within two days, we had everything packed out. So really hats off to the ranger for being sensitive to um, the tragedy, to being sensitive to protecting wilderness character and managing our impacts. And then hats off to the crew for hanging in there and getting the job done. So um, that's our story. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and now on to you, Tori. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Tori Haka. I am currently the Eastern Region Authorities Coordinator, and I sit in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right above Wisconsin and not quite Canada and still tied to the state of Michigan. Um, so I'm speaking to you from the regional coordinator position where I'm primarily, re primarily responsible for NFS implementation tools through special congressional authorities, as well as initiatives such as stewardship contracting and agreements, good neighbor authority, et cetera. The story and honor of being here today comes from a 2019 uh, traditional skills and minimum tool award that the Ottawa National Forest in region nine staff and mule pack string members from the Shoshone National Forest and partners from the Nature Conservancy received in 2019. At that time and prior to 2019, I sat as the forest stewardship coordinator for the Ottawa National Forest, where I was primarily responsible for bringing the Nature Conservancy together with uh, the Ottawa National Forest program managers to collaborate on what sort of restoration work we were going to do inside our stewardship agreement. And the stewardship agreement is where we were leveraging the sale of federal timber to generate monies that could be used for restoration work across the national forest. And at that time we were packaging kind of traditional things for the Lake Superior Basin, riparian planting, uh, some other you know, timber stand improvement type work. And it was at that time when we started really talking to the Nature Conservancy who was based out of a different area in the UP we started talking about the McCormick Wilderness Area, and that is a detached 16,000 acre wilderness area that the Ottawa National Forest manages, but it's completely detached from the population around the Ottawa. And it actually serves this other denser populated area of Marquette, Michigan, which is where TNC is located. So it became a mutual interest and mutual benefit for the Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy to see what type of restoration we, work we could do in the wilderness area, trying to align priorities for resource values, as well as different stakeholders and visitors to the wilderness area itself. So as we moved and progressed through the life of the agreement, we did discover that there was a specific area within the wilderness area that had a sensitive botanical wetland bog species that was being impacted by visitor use. And when it turned out, the visitors had to go through the bog, mostly because there was no way to get around the bog. We had a cliff situation, as well as just this big wetland, and people were walking right through the middle of it. So the PNC and the wilderness and recreation program managers on the forest came up with the idea of a 400-foot um, 
boardwalk, more or less, that got the, the visitors up out of the water and also protected the botanical species. Uh, it was then that I think we realized the importance of collaboration. I mean, when it came to the Nature Conservancy and their crew, they couldn't just hike stuff in, they couldn't just drive stuff into the site. And we had to do a whole new segment of what it meant to train new and maybe not traditional wilderness partners for the National Forest into what it meant to use um, minimum tools and have traditional skills. So when we started brainstorming, the creativity behind all of this was, well, maybe we could use sled dogs. Well, maybe we could use this. Maybe we could use that. And for a lot of us, it was a brand new experience. See, I come from the world in purview of a forester. This whole thing was brand new to me and it was to our partners as well. It was because of the collaboration and coordination and the network that traditional skills and minimum tools has across the country, which is how we got enlisted with the Shoshone pack mule string. We had the Wyoming folks drive all the way out with 10 mules, four horses, and the four handlers at the cusp of fall, almost winter, rain, sleet, and snow. Um, you have to see it to believe it but they came all the way across to Lake Superior and they packed in the wood, they helped uh, the Nature Conservancy pack in the, the saws and the drills that were to be used. And together before the next use of, in, in the spring, they all put together the 400 board foot walk. And it was because of that, the creativity, but perseverance to coordinate and collaborate across the whole country that we got the, uh, the honor of receiving the traditional skills and minimum tools award in 2019. So that's the story. I'm very honored to be here and I'm hoping to provide a new perspective to the group, not quite being in the recreation and wilderness world, but being pretty wholeheartedly touched by it. So thanks, Jimmy. That's what I got. Hey, thank, thank you all. Um, boy, it's super cool to hear your stories and they're so um, unique and different. And um, I'll admit that I didn't read um, all the background for your awards. And so <laughs> hearing it the first time, um, yeah, it's cool. It, it's great to hear just how we're approaching things differently and think about the complexities and challenges people are, are facing uh, and getting work done sometimes and, and working through that. And so uh, thank you. Um, so, so with that, uh, hopefully, uh, as we move into these questions, uh, some of that comes through as well. Um, so, so the first question that we had teed up, and Adam, we're going to ask you to kick us off um, for this one, but what do you see as keys to success in promoting the use of traditional skills in the work you do? Where does that success come from? Yeah, I think, so if we want to talk about keys to success in promoting the use of traditional skills. I feel like really where that comes from is to, to tell the story similar to what Tori just told, but is, um, is that we need to highlight the necessity of these skills. The fact that we have these logistical problems, which may or may not be tied to the Wilderness Act. Um, but these are, there. it's a wide breadth of skills that the agency has that we can pull people together for um, to accomplish this on the ground tasks in these wild places, wilderness or just wild lands too, right? So I really think it's highlight the necessity to upper, upper management, you know, Washington level to allow them to understand, I think I might've just disappeared. Am I still, oh, never mind. My computer did something else. I didn't disappear. A window popped up. Okay. Where was I? Um, I think again on the the highlight the necessity um, that we that we paint the the picture that we tell the story of why this agency needs skilled individuals in these key roles and to and to retain this on the ground information to be able to do these tasks that although maybe they don't come up very often um, the ability to functionally deal with them in-house is tremendous. So I think the, the key to success there is just, again, that highlight the necessity, you know, kind of keep the momentum behind this program. You know, Jimmy, I, I think we're kind of rolling off of each other, if you don't mind. So I, I think one of the biggest advantages of enlisting um, a partner to join us in such a, a unique experience with like the Nature Conservancy was surely that storytelling, Adam. I mean, 
the, they did a, an entire drone video on the project and the cinematography, the music that was tied to it. I mean, there's a long and short, you know, there's like a one minute preview of the whole adventure. And then there's like a three to four minute version. And I mean, it's inspiring. So I, I completely agree with you, Adam, whether it's us in-house as the Forest Service learning to tell our story about how, how there is so much skill around managing and preserve, well, not managing, but preserving our wilderness areas that, um, you know, sometimes having partners invited to the table are really one of the ones that can help us provide that capacity or skill set that we may not have internally, but it, it was a big asset that we had for our story. And people in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan maybe don't understand the difference between the wilderness area and maybe your state forest or even the national forest. Uh, but having a story like this was able to tell completely different. And having a few snapshots of the Shoshone pack mule string out on the shores of Lake Superior was a pretty cool publicity piece too. <laughs> Thanks, Tori. That's exactly the kind of dialogue we're, we're looking for. And I guess I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that, that it is part of the Forest Service policy for us to um, maintain uh, these skills and make sure I think we use the word staff in our manual, but uh, I think when we think of staff, we think of not just agency employees, but also our partners and volunteers. And um, I think of training too, training needs. And so I'm throwing that out there just to see if, if that sparks any uh, thoughts for any of the other panel members. Yeah, Jimmy, I, I really agree with that, that training thing. And I think that's where we um, sometimes are challenged, right, with getting the right trainings out there in these traditional skills. And um, I know for us and my example of our crosscut Sawyer efforts with our volunteer organization, you know, we were putting on crosscut saw trainings for our Forest Service staff. And when we had a couple spots, we'd throw in a few volunteers and we realized into the future, that model wasn't going to work. And often at the beginning of the season, it was hard for us to put on multiple crosscut classes. So we tapped into the ACES program. There's this woman in Region 2 who, um, Ann Dalvera, who came back on to help certify specifically volunteer and partner organizations in crosscut saw work. So now, you know, we're sending like one of our folks to help her with that certification, and she's kind of taking on that. So Kind of looking for maybe other ways to accomplish the training um, outside of you know for service trainings has been really um, helpful for us here. So I wonder, you know, we we always tend to focus on crosscut saws, um, but when we think about traditional skills, there there are other things that typically come um, under that umbrella. And um, wonder how we're perpetuating some of those. I think um, the blasting program comes to mind. I'm not sure if anybody's up to speed on where things are there. And I know that's not for every part of the country. Tree climbing, um, you know, the use of block and tackle. Um, how do you all think we're doing as far as promoting those skills? Like where are the centers of excellence for those skills being housed? So I think for, it's a great question. And yeah, definitely outside of crosscut saws. Um, you know, I think is probably 12 years ago on the White River, we had a traditional, you know, bridge building skills workshop. And it's been 12 years, literally, since we've had that return to our forest. And I feel like how we're accomplishing it is through mentoring um, of our wilderness rangers and staff. And it's just kind of those informal opportunities where oh, we're going to replace the wilderness bridge you know our staff comes on board but i feel like there's definitely room for improvement in terms of the more formal um and um ways to do it and like let's get together as a whole forest or a region and put on some more of those um you know trainings um for like traditional skills and building structures and stuff like that so definitely room for improvement and I think more collaboration across forests on that one here.
Yeah, Jimmy, you asked where these different skills of blasting, horsemanship, rigging, stuff like that um, being housed. And and I have a list of like four people in my mind right now. I was like, well, that's where they're being housed. Um, but but where are they being housed? So anyone who doesn't work on the, the local district where my buddy Kib works can can get a hold of all this, these skills and this knowledge. And, and I don't think it is being housed anywhere you know, that's really available and accessible to everyone. Um, in 2019, I taught a rigging class at Nine Mile, the Nine Mile Wildland Heritage Center, if you're not familiar with that. So I taught a rigging class at Nine Mile and it was, went really well and it was super booked out for the years to come. The years to come happened to be pandemic years. So although it was booked multiple, multiple weeks out, those never got taught. And now I'm a recreation staff officer and I'm kind of left the world of traditional skills and I can't boogie over to nine mile to teach these things anymore. So I feel like I'm just painting a bad picture, but but I think just you know, similar to what Cindy said is, well, where are they housed, Jimmy? That was your question. Well, they're not, and what do we need to do? And it's those regional trainings, I think, that are really helpful. And whether it's Adam going to nine mile teaching or like in region one, we teach Typically, again, barring any rascally pandemics, we've got the Region 1 um, Wilderness Skills Institute where we get together and, and the best individuals and stuff like stonemasonry, right? That's a place in, in this agency that we're really lacking. Teach a week on that. And the axe person teaches a week on that. But really, that those community building things and skill building things where we can teach kind of complex problem solving around these wildlands and wilderness issues are are where it should be housed. Now, where is it housed? Again, pandemic sidebar, but it needs to be housed at these at the regional level where you can take your best six individuals and tell them build a class around this and build a class around that so we can go back um, to our respective areas and and make the landscape better and make the trail systems better, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's that's awesome, Adam. Not being in your, your field, I instantly think like the amount of attrition and turnover that we're having as an agency, if it's been 12 years since Cindy's had, you know, traditional trail or bridge building, you know, it's like, how are we gonna, capitalize on that gap before we lose the opportunity. I mean, we're thankful to have Kelly here who's in re recent retirement and she's still sharing her experience, but I mean, whether it's regionally or nationally, I mean, opportunities like this somewhere in region nine, the Ottawa program manager knew where the pack mule streams were, right? We have one in Southern Illinois down on the Shawnee, wasn't available for the Midwest and the up Midwest. So where do you go next, right? And it's unfortunate it was Wyoming, cool experience, super happy to have those guys join us out here, guys and gals, but um, that network, right? That's what we're gonna end up either losing or missing or something that if we can't do it in person, thankfully we've found venues like this where we can record and share and we can leverage that as much as we can, but it's another skill set where if we don't prioritize getting together and talking and learning it, we're going to lose it. And then it's kind of like infrastructure. It's hard to get it back once it's gone. And so that's my two cents from outside of it. But listening and experiencing some of it, you know, the attrition rate's going to go much faster than we want it to. And, and then we're going to be stuck trying to relearn everything all over again. <laughs> I'm going to leave a pause here just in case anyone wants to respond um, to, to that dialogue, but I have a thought to share as well. So, hey, the word network stuck out to me, connecting and training. And um, in my mind, I know there's a lot of folks talking about surge hiring right now. We're about to have potentially a lot of new employees coming on board um, to the agency. And so just thinking about ways to perpetuate that network, um, you know, I think it's it's just like everything else. It's been handed down from 
generation to generation, like here's who we work with for that. And this is how we get this done. But um, thinking about how we're going to um, maybe bring some new folks into that fold and, and help them connect and, um, and provide the training um, and the skills that they need as well. And so I don't have any, um, any, anything, I don't have the answer. I think some of what we're doing um, will help, but um, maybe um, a more uh, strategic approach nationally might be worth looking at it at some point is what's going through my head. Um, I do want to get us back on script a little bit, but Kelly, I wanted to actually ask you a question um, because your project is, is so different and um, it, it does tie to this key to success question, right? It struck me that I've seen the kind of projects you had with um, an aircraft wreckage. And um, sometimes the, the biggest challenge in that is getting the entire team on board with what is the right approach to, to, to that, including especially the decision makers, the line officers. I don't know if you could speak a little bit to like how you came to success with that, what you thought brought you to that decision for your project. Well, thanks for letting me respond. So yeah, I think what helped us there is we had a window of about 24 hours where we didn't have to make a hurry up, shoot from the hip, if you will, kind of decision so we could step back and the emergency had passed. So we could uh, reflect a little bit more, look at the resources that we had and truly although lots of times in these situations, you, you don't have the time to think first and foremost, what's better for the wilderness. And having a district ranger who, um, you know, has a strong background in wilderness uh, was very, very helpful. And, and his personality type as well is like, well, wait a minute, let's think this through. What do we have? What do we need? And what can we do? So I think that 24 hours, uh, of time we had to really think before acting um, helped us make make the right decision for the wilderness. And then just looking to our trail crew and, and really um, thinking they have the skills that we need. Um, it's not complex, but they can, you know, they can do it if they're willing and they did. So does that kind of answer your question a little bit maybe? It does, that helps. Um, thanks, Kelly. Okay, I'm gonna jump back into um, the questions we, we had before us. And I know we've kind of moved into this already, but uh, Cindy, I'm gonna ask you to respond to this one first. And it is, uh, what are the challenges to keeping traditional skills alive? Yeah, so kind of rolling in from the previous question, which kind of started to address this is, you know, I think sometimes it's just taking the time to stop and see where our gaps are um, and to come up with that plan, you know, moving forward. Like Jimmy, you said, you know, maybe some kind of national networking. And I think we're all kind of on the go and moving and, you know, field season's coming up and then that ends and we're planning for the next season. And I think it's just that pause button to, okay, we've got to like sit down, figure out where our holes are, our gaps are, you know, in trainings, you know, what do we need to offer? throughout the region and kind of come up with yeah, the plan of how we're going to tackle that. And it might not be in a year, it might be kind of like a multi-year plan and, you know, get those trainings um, on the ground and, and kind of scheduled. So, so that's kind of one thought that I have. And then another, and I think I definitely know this has already started to happen, but, um, you know, some, for some of us who work in the forest service, um, it's maybe changing our mind um, set from these traditional tools are only rooted in forest service tradition to these tools are also rooted in the traditions of our partner organizations. And I, we take great pride in this, these traditional skills being rooted in the forest service, but I think more and more they're also becoming, you know, the traditions of our, of our partners and just, you know, we, we, I hear constantly, well, we used to have the trail crew to be able to do this work. We used to have this, you know, forest service crews. And it's really, you know, taking that multi-pronged approach with partners and stuff. And, and I know we, we all do that. And I think it's, you know, the wave of the future and it has been occurring already. Um, 
And then just for the Forest Service, you know, for us to have the bandwidth to be a good partner, you know, on the other end of that as well. So yeah, I think just hitting the pause button, scheduling, putting that day on the calendar to, to brainstorm some stuff and try and come up with a plan of, you know, I specifically think trainings um, and keeping those skills alive. Anyone else wanna respond to the challenges you see? I know we did um, start to get into some of that. Well, I think from the, the experience that we had in the Midwest, like there was a lot of things where we could have probably said no, <laughs> right? Like as soon as it was, well, you're gonna enlist folks from the Shoshone to come out and do a 400 foot boardwalk. There were a lot of things that we could have been like, yeah, maybe it's not economically viable or man, it's at the tail end of the season. We could be hitting a whole bunch of weather or there was just a lot of things that could have precluded us to say no. And, and so you know, those continue to be challenges. I think specifically the economic determination behind what's right for the wilderness and what's the right minimum tool may not always be the easy button, right? We just heard all of your stories, specifically the airplane removal in the wilderness area. I mean, there's a much easier way, I'm sure, that's more cost effective. And so I would think a challenge to this group is, is just, yeah, articulating what those values are, right? We, in our agency specifically, we talk a lot about values, but each program in each aspect of our multi-use agency has a different set of values. And so being able to articulate that it's not an easy button all the time, you know, this is where these skills are going to take time and effort and energy. And that's where Adam came in with, with the storytelling, right? I mean, these people need to feel the impact that we're doing in the wilderness area. And so I just think that we can't let challenges be the end all be all, you know, it's easy to say no sometimes. It's probably easier in this world now to say no than yes. And so yeah, I just applaud all of the stories that I'm hearing and the perseverance to it. So that's my my take on it. Thanks, Tori. Hey, I had a few things come to mind, um, and some of this will be for maybe in the chat uh, as as we're having this session, um, and some of it maybe you all can respond to if you know. But um, I know one thing is. Uh, for wilderness stewardship performance, which is our national performance measure, we do have a workforce capacity element that looks at um, skills. Like, are you maintaining the needed skills to get the work done? And I guess I would throw out there um, to our group, although I'm, I'm sure not all of us are familiar with that, or to the larger group participating in this session, you know, is that is that meeting the needs or is there something we need to do to update that? Is that something we can pull from and tell a story about what skills are there and, and identify what skills might be needed? Um, so that's one thought. The other is just information. Um, I know the trails analysis, trails, um, help me out, the TAG, um, the trails advisory group has worked on a interactive map that shows where certain skills are housed across the country. And uh, maybe during this session, that map can be shared so that folks can have access to it and maybe have some further dialogue uh, in the, in the Q&A. And so anyway, I'm throwing those out there for the broader discussion with the Q&A, but if any of you have something to add to that, feel free to. Jimmy, I'll just, this is Kelly, just one quick thought. And uh, when I developed our um, workforce capacity spreadsheet that I made, I was really surprised at how many skills that we did have that we weren't giving ourselves credit for. Um, so that was, that was interesting. And then over a couple of years, people moved on, went to different jobs. So th those were skills that we lost. So for me, as a, you know, when I was looking at what I hope to get accomplished, and, and we have seven wilderness areas here, and, and the work that I was hoping to get accomplished, it, it was good, it was a good place for me to source out who could do what, and then 
then be thinking about how I planned my work based on the resources that I had. So for me personally, that workforce capacity tool, um, it made a big difference for me. So those are my thoughts. That's good to hear. And I know, I think not everyone's familiar with that. And maybe that's another part of the work is um, making sure that folks like Tori even um, are aware of that type of work and what we have um, on paper and what we've identified as a need so that as, as we get opportunities that she highlighted, uh, you know, that, that might be something we chase. So I'm gonna move us on to our, our final question, but I want to just, uh, before I do that, make sure um, no one's like uh, biting that chomp, so to speak, to share anything on that last one. Okay, thanks for bearing with me. Um, so, so the last question we decided we wanted to explore, and this, this is, I, I love doing these exercises. It's maybe where you get to, to dream a little bit. Uh, and so putting on our dream hats. Uh, and this goes to you, Tori, to, to kick us off. But if you could change one thing uh, with the way that we approach using traditional skills in the agency and the Forest Service in particular, what would that be? Yeah, so thanks for that question. I, I mean, I feel like I end up being a, a pretty good dreamer for the group. Um, but I feel like we talked a lot about my initial top ones that popped forward, you know, like access to, to training um, and instructional videos that anyone can have opportunity to view. The Nature Conservancy dials up in a Zoom meeting to watch what, you know, how to, use one of the fancy drills to screw in up. You know, see, I don't even know what the tools are called. So if I were to change one thing, <laughs> it would be cross-pollination within the agency, but then the opportunity to externally share that and to tell that story, but not just the storytelling that tugs on our heartstrings, but gives people the opportunity to participate. And a lot of us do that at a local level, right? We're hearing volunteers or even non-traditional partners to, to wilderness, at least in our areas like the Nature Conservancy, but being able to create that network only internally and externally, I think is a really big deal. I mean, the chief has said that the surge capacity, Jimmy, that you bring up, uh, some of it will be Forest Service, but that is not the sole intent. You know, there is an intent that partners will be there and we will be good stewards of the land together. And so one thing to change, I think, is just that internal capability for us all to be aware of what we're doing so we can assist and show up together, but then to reach externally as well. And then one thing that I was resonating and ruminating on this weekend around this question was, as oddly as this sounds, we're coming out of a global pandemic where people were more interested than exploring the outdoors and nature than they have been in a couple decades, if not more. And you know, when, if you grew or harvested or raised chickens, you went to a store and you couldn't buy chickens, you couldn't buy seeds. You know, there's a there's a, a missing link in society right now that I feel like this specific skill set, building your own things, connecting with nature, going back to wilderness the way it needs and should be preserved. There could be a capital to build on there coming out of this pandemic. And, and I know, Jimmy, that's not totally internally focused in the Forest Service. But that's where we bring in the support capacity and the surge that we need to address all of this. So it's not one thing, and we've talked a lot about more than one thing, but if we could change anything, it's just, you know, building stronger and leaning forward together, I think, in a more meaningful way. Thanks, Tori. That was great. Um, and this is all of our chance to share the dream. And so I'll you know, throw it back to uh, the other panel members, if you have something that comes to mind. Sure, thanks, Jimmy. Um, you know, one thing that I wrote down while Tori was talking about how people are learning to grow a chicken for the first time or plant a tomato well before the frost leaves the ground if you're in the UP, right? Um, and trying all these new things something like on a society level that we realize that we're lacking is this like complex salt problem solving, you know, in for tangible problems, this like, well, how do you build a small punch in and make it square and make it level? 
that's so difficult or is it that difficult um and so so we're looking at these things that like used to be givens like yeah that's easy go build a punch and go back pack a mule right like a hundred years ago everyone was like yeah for sure you know the first chief of the forest service could do all those things um and now it's it's not it's not commonplace anymore so as we used to look at these skills as givens um they're not anymore and they need a lot more mentorship you know i said earlier i was a wilderness ranger for 12 years and i came in with the three seasons of, of forest service seasonal work before so i worked seasonal for 17 years for the forest service after 17 years I could pack a mule, ride a horse, blow things up, sharpen cross, cut saws, climb trees, rig, stuff like that. 17 years it took me to be a functional field technician. Uh, and that takes a long time to build these skills and, and it takes a lot of dedication. Um, my big dream would be if we could maybe professionalize these skill sets because I left my dream job because it's a GS7 you know, I wanted to own a home someday and, and the agency doesn't monetarily value these skills to what, what I feel like they should be. And I know that maybe that sounds like a money gripe or wh whatever, but, but it's also real is, is that like, these are large things that if it takes you 14 years of field experience to get like kind of minimum buy-in good at your job, like that's a lot of work and a lot of input. And so, um, I think, let's see, Who's, I forgot who said it before, but you know, things about people moving on. We have people in the agency that have these skills, but they've left the places where these skills are used. And, um, and just because that's the way our tiered system works. And if I could change one thing, it would be to professionalize these skill sets to have locked in trainers in the region or maybe even supervisor's office place to like help us build and grow capacity and go out for weeks at a time and, and make things happen. Because right now when we have complex things it's like all right what what contractor will do that and even on gardner ranger district there's a bridge that needs to get ripped apart and put back together this next summer or next year and we're looking at contractors i can do it but i'm tied to my desk this ranger district has the skills to do it but if someone's not administrating the permits then we're gonna to go to contracting. So I feel like the one thing that I would really like to change would be to perfect, to realize how lacking these skills are across really the greater community right now of complex problem solving, especially complex problem solving in construction and wild places and, and to work towards professionalizing it so, so we can have people, agency, partners, volunteers, et cetera, that are, that are yet working in these realms because um, there's so much passion there everybody wants to ride a horse and pack a mule but but to be able to do that um, and 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 provide for yourself I think is is a challenge Adam I love your vision and I think that there are a lot of people that would have taken that career path had it been, some potential um, opportunities for a higher GS level. So, and those folks are now, you know, maybe driving desks and they really should be out there, you know, doing exactly, <laughs> um, you know, utilizing those skills. So that's awesome. I, I love that. Um, I think for me to kind of tag onto that, you know, I would love to see some more like nine mile style training centers um, maybe spread throughout the country, um, you know, I know that that's the place to go to learn some of those skills. And I just think we, we need that housed, um, you know, potentially in each region, honestly. Um, I know that's a lot, but, um, you know, we could send folks there to gain those. Um, or even potentially, you know, I feel like we're even fighting for keeping like our regional pack strings alive, you know, like our Rocky Mountain regional pack string that used to be here and has moved now. Um, up to Wyoming, which is awesome. It's still around, but I know there's a lot of fight going on to, to keep those, those like pack strings. And that's what I feel like we constantly have to do is kind of beat that drum about why these skills are so important. Kind of going back to that first question where we all kind of mentioned, you know, we have to be able to articulate the why behind 
why these things are important and how it meets our wilderness objectives and how it stays true to you know meeting wilderness character, which you know the Wilderness Act you know kind of commands us to do. So, yeah, I'd like to see some more training centers you know established throughout um, the country. I, I agree, Adam. Um, very well said, and um, appreciate you sharing that. It, it's um, worth getting out there and will probably resonate with a lot of folks who are participating in this session. Any other dreams anybody want to share? Well, I guess I would like to tee up the group who's participating in this to also think about a few things that I know I heard. Um, one is that that balancing uh, the skills and the work between partners and the agency, like how do we um, think about what the right balance is? We wanna be at the table. We want our partners to know that we're there, but at the same time, we want to um, work with partners and recognize the multiple benefits of getting work done through partnership. And so it's, it's not a one size fits all, but how do we um, thoughtfully approach that in the future, especially as it comes to maintaining uh, traditional skills? Um, and I guess the other thing to tee up is really this idea of like, you know, what what type of training and how much is needed and has to be available in the future for us to be able to do the work uh, that we're called on to do here. Um, and certainly a workforce discussion. What does a workforce look like um, that's maybe professionalized, but um, embraces the skills you need to get some of this done and at the same time, with a lot of other program areas are thinking about, you know, but can make sure someone can uh, have a living wage, so to speak, and um, and support uh, support a family. Um, hey, um, thank you all for, for taking the time today. Uh, Cindy, Adam, Tori, Kelly, I know you have a lot going on. Um, and uh, your stories were, amazing. Uh, it, it's great to have the diversity of stories to share about the different awards uh, and why you received them and the creative approaches to promoting traditional skills, both within the agency and with our partners. And um, hopefully we can all loop back and uh, see the Q&A discussion and that happens after this is shared because I think it'll also um, spin off some other uh, things for us to work on. Well, that was a lot of thought provoking discussion, wasn't it? I do want to go to Kelly and Kelly, if you would turn your camera on, um, Adam and Cindy are doing what they do for these awards. They're out teaching traditional skills classes. They're out um, onboarding. So they're not with us live. And of course, Tori was live this when we started. Um, but Kelly, just a couple of things since you're here with us, and then we might open the, the chat to um, just some dialogue with the audience too. But um, just wondering, one thing that, that Jimmy said, let's talk about this. As a retiree, you have a different perspective. You know, is there anything about this conversation that you could look back and change? Is there anything you're really proud of? And after hearing all this conversation and everything in the chat was connected, it was all about the challenge of maintaining these skills, it was all about the challenge of having what Jimmy and Adam talked about was um, a working wage for the dedication and the, and the talent that it takes to maintain these. So would you have any perspective looking back over your career on that? Um, well, for one thing, the, the cool part about working in wilderness for me was um, that we had to become excellent problem solvers, never enough people, never enough money, never enough time. So it helped us be able to um, look sideways at something in order to meet it head on, if that makes any sense. So uh, if those skills weren't readily available, well, okay, well, how do we get those skills and where are we gonna look to find those skills? Um, so a lot of times it was just uh, like someone like myself stepping up and, and making something happen. Does that that kind of answer the question? It does. And, and Rachel just put in the chat too, 
if we think of a project or a person that should be nominated for these, um, where do you get the applications? How did that go? And Kelly, we can add to this, but, but go ahead and, and from your perspective, how did that nomination process come down? How did it go? Um, I'm trying to remember because of 2016, a lot's happened since then. Um, um, I think the call letter comes from the Washington office to the regional office and then filters out to, to the individual forest and then the individual forest nominate if they have someone they'd like to recognize and then th those flow upward. That's how I remember it going. And, and that's how I know it as well. And it usually comes around the fall, usually around September, if I remember right. Um, there is a, a lot of explanation usually in the call letter. Um, there's usually an attachment that asks you to address certain areas of expertise or certain areas of nomination. So um, if you think you have someone or you have a project or a team or a group of people, um, you can get back to me, you can get back to Tobin or Kelly. We'll try to run that down for you. If you have a connection to your wilderness program manager at the forest or the regional level, just reach out and ask them. Um, if you're a partner, you're a partner with somebody. So reach out and ask that partner because this is forest service driven. Um, we'd be glad to see more. I know, I know sometimes we don't get enough nominations in all the categories. So really want to promote that. Thanks, Kelly. Um, mm -hmm. So with with that, I'd like to explore a question for Jimmy and go ahead and raise your hands. I think there's about 30 of you. I think we can manage a live chat with that many. Um, this idea of, and it intrigues me and it has for a long time, I think Togan as well and all of you, how are we gonna get to a point? What do we need to do? And what are the tasks associated with memorializing this skill as Adam talked about, as a skill that is valued, that the talent is gained through experience and then that experience lends itself to promotion through the agency, that you don't have to promote out of this traditional tool expertise as many, and I'm aware of this too, as many of our trail specialists, our wilderness specialists, our packers, they do now, they get to a seven and then they need to move on and they move out of the field. How do, how do we address this very important skill? How do we address the retention for that? And just go ahead and raise your hands if you, I'd really like to have a little discussion about this. It seems like the chat just sort of blew up after Adam's conversation. Everybody was in agreement that something needs to be done. So can we get a start on that? What is that something? Chris. I see you just turned your video on. Did you want to go ahead and chat about that? Go ahead and turn your mic on. Yeah, I I echo what what Adam said. Um, I'm a twenty some plus year GS seven because uh, I value that the importance of getting to teach teach folks in the traditional skills, and I just see us. Yeah, there's just less and less people that are out there being able to to do it and to teach it in the field and because you have to move up to, to the rec officer position and then there's so much uh, bureaucracy to deal with if you want to do your job well you do need to stay, stay at the desk to make things happen but anyways um i feel like i look at dolly chapman right who worked with the agency she's retired and she's kind of like doing contract work like is there something or Either that, like we have a group that can travel regionally and, and put on courses for folks, um, whether it be an enterprise format or even a, a forest service team. Um, you know, I've just seen like maybe something is, and the people that'd be willing to do that, obviously, but some kind of team that could travel around and teach folks. We, we have some, we have nine mile, we have the Pack Stock Center of Excellence, I know, in Region 5 for packing. Um, but in regards to more of the trail skills, the saw work, the rigging, um, dry stone masonry, I feel like if we don't um, invest in some employees that could take on regional programs or something to help uh, just literally train people and, and hold courses and help organize them, that just forests could send people to these things. Uh, would be really beneficial to, to try to maintain the traditional skills. 
So I'm thinking that I'm hearing you say maybe we're lacking a career ladder, a career track to some kind of regional training. Like if you if you got to the end of that GS7 and you wanted to promote, perhaps it's to a nine, perhaps it's to 11 in some kind of center of excellence program where you can still practice and teach your, your skills. And somebody, I think it was Cindy and others said, we have some of those programs, but it doesn't seem like they're very well either supported or we don't have a lot of personnel um, engaged in those career ladders right now. And if you want to add into this discussion, just go ahead and turn your video on and we'll try to call on you. But otherwise, Chris, go ahead and, and respond to that if you'd like to. Um, I, I do agree that it's there's value in having some people at a higher grade level that can continue to teach these skills and and take ownership in doing it because we all have so much to do. It's you can't be a, a staff rec a rec staff officer and also teach a bunch of courses throughout the year. Um, so it, it needs to be. I feel like it'd be great to have some employees that that's their job. They're dedicated to maintaining teaching traditional skills and organizing it, which is, you know, a lot of work and it definitely offer it's uh, it's office work associated with that as well. And it's definitely worthy of a higher grade level than a seven, in my opinion. Thank you for that. I did see in the chat where a number of um, regions are saying, you know, they're tracking these people with these skills. We have our um, wilderness skill sheets that we track this, but then what do we do with it? You know, I'm hearing maybe Maybe there's a national cadre in the making or regional representatives to a national cadre to where there is some focus on not only the development of these skills, but the retention and the, the promotion to higher grade levels where people can actually work and retain these skills as they work up. So good thoughts. Um, Kelly. Uh, so I'll turn myself back on, sorry. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So um, right before I retired, I was um, the Region 9 representative to the Chiefs Wilderness Advisory Group. And it's, it's this is feeling like something to me that um, maybe the WAG could try their hand at coming up with some ideas. Maybe um, it, it looks like, and, and when I left, Chris was, um, Chris was still on WAG. So, and I don't wanna make more work for them, but maybe in the future, this would be a good opportunity, something for them to um, see if they can wrap around it a little bit. As we close this session, I just, what a thought provoking discussion and panel. And um, we're so grateful that we have this technology to where even if you're in the field, you can share your thoughts in this discussion with others. And it's still very, very valuable. So as we close, I just wanna thank Adam and Cindy and Kelly and Tori for being really engaged and committed to this discussion from many different perspectives. And while we do have these modern technologies that allow us to all connect virtually, I know that the four of them want you to know that the best way to connect, right, is human to human so that we can value these traditions and keep them alive and keep them taught and keep them learned in the field. And so we need to remember that as we walk away from this session this week and we go back to the field with the enthusiasm of carrying some of this discussion, some of this learning forward. 